Good evening. Welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center, HardcoreChristianity.com. YouTubers, thank you for showing up tonight. It's seminar night. I got an interesting revelation for you. But before I do that, I got to do these again real quick. Okay. I get these in the mail and, uh, you know, the city of Phoenix is required by law to send out notices for people that, that move into your neighborhood who are sex perverts. People have been convicted of sex crimes. And uh, Robert Solis, Domingo Guillermo, Carlos Gutierrez, and Fernando Muñiz. This one's particularly sad. This kid looks like he's in his 20s. Now, these people here are... Uh, Included in the agape, unconditional love of God. In fact, no matter what sin you committed, you are falling into the category of the unconditional love of God. Now, I know what causes sex perverts. I've been a counselor for over 40 years. I counseled a lot of sex addicts over the years, and I know... These lust demons get into your body, usually when you're a child, usually during periods of abuse or extreme disappointment as a kid, and they morph your sexuality, and they hyperventilate your sex drive. They also cause uh, gender fluidity, homosexuality, gay, lesbian, all these things these perverted demons do. They get in your body, and then they... Morph your sexuality when you go through puberty and they damage you, you know. And these guys are damaged, but they can be saved and delivered. And uh, since you're here with me and we're all friends, I thought we'd pray for them and God will go hunt them down. The Holy Ghost is good at that. In fact, He's an expert. Lord, I got. Four more of these things in the mail this week. I know what's causing their miserable lives. I know how badly hurt they are and lost. I know that they're, they don't want to be sex perverts. They don't want to be sexual criminals. They don't want to do the things they did. I know the demons are pushing them to do it. And so I'm asking you, in Jesus' holy name, go hunt these four guys down. Go get them, Lord. I want the miracle to happen. I want you to bring them right here to this altar. I want to see them personally right down here, right here. I'm asking you to save them and heal them in Jesus' name. Amen. The next seminar is September 29th there. Let's get to the your favorite part of the service, which is the announcements. There's our YouTube teaching channel. I got all kinds of teachings on there. YouTube.com slash House of Healing AZ. If you'd like to catch some of my old radio programs, I've been on the radio for over 20 years here in the Valley, just go to the website, hit homepage, go to the media button, streaming, radio, bang, you're there. Got them all archived on the website. If you'd like to help us financially, uh, you can switch over from Google to Good Search and put in our charity name, and they will pay us money whenever you surf the web. If you know someone that can't come here for help and they need to be delivered, you can send me an email at mike at hardcorechristianity.com and I'll send you the miracle list which works 100% of the time. Obviously the problem is I can only get about 10% of the people to do the list after I send it to them. That, that's the big hurdle. So what you got to do when you get the list is you do it one step at a time. Just look at one. Just do one. Don't look at all of them at once. Just do one. And you're there. God will help you. There's my deliverance training course if you happen to be called into this ministry. This will save you a lot of time and energy. Want to know about our future? There's the seven churches of Revelation. It's going to get crazy down the road. Don't forget about our Zoom healing services. Wednesday night, men and women, right here. Send me an email and I'll send you the ID and the passcode. Wednesday night, 
6 o'clock. There's our Tithely app. You can download that on your phone if you want to donate to us. Thank you. We got donation boxes on the doors as you leave. If you're interested, you can donate on the website. Hit the PayPal button. I will see you tomorrow in the small sanctuary. That would be that one for our deliverance training class. That's my favorite service of the month. Lots of good Q&A in that. So that's a really interesting class. We got a lot of time to develop stuff and answer questions. There's my radio programs. I'm on uh, every Monday through Friday, 7.30 in the morning and 7.15 on 10.10 10 a.m. There's my new radio ministry. It's on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock on 1160 Conservative Talk Radio here in the Valley. There's my podcast, Sunday mornings, 9 o'clock. You just go to twitch.tv, boom, and you put in HCCADC, and you and I are together on Sunday morning. You'll enjoy it. YouTubers, remember, open up an ambush team in your church. Two or three people get together. You start picking off the sick people. They start getting healed. Word of mouth brings you more. All of a sudden, you got this booming ministry in your mega church. Mega churches are the best places to do this in. If you do it in a home group where you've only got five people, that's going to be a little more difficult. <laughs> Tuesday nights is our ladies only Zoom deliverance service. Okay, there's the ID number and the passcode. Tuesday nights at 6:30. PM Pacific time. All right. Julie wants to know if anyone wants to continue with the Miracle List support group on Tuesday nights here at uh, six six thirty, I believe. If you do want to continue, it's going to start on September twelfth. Please send her an email and sign up for the class Tuesday night six thirty, small sanctuary. Those are the books I wrote, one on Satan, one on healing, one on curing mental illness there in the bookstore, and we are on these platforms. Our Thursday night and Friday night teachings are all run here. Rumble, we're getting a lot of good uh, hits on Rumble. That's going good. There it is. Just put in H-O-H-H-C-C and you're there. I thought I'd do this one last time. Not going to do it again. I'd like to get a man manager couple for the healing house next door. We have a residential facility. We let people come from out of state and stay there for free for a few days while they're getting delivered and healed. But I don't have a residential manager. You know, unfortunately, it's not a paid position, but you get all your expenses covered. I was hoping for a married couple, you know, kind of a retired couple, something like that, who still wanted to stay in ministry. It's not a very hard job. You're just scheduling people for beds, bed A, bed B, bed C, you know, and then you got to kind of coordinate with the airport, that kind of thing. There's not much to it, but you got to do some supervising. If you know somebody who might be interested in that, you might send me an email. Mike at HardcoreChristianity.com. Appreciate that. If nobody shows up, well, then uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep praying about it. I don't know where I'm going with that. Man, demons, demons suck. Um, they're all so nasty. They're filthy. They're vulgar. They're evil. They're hateful. Oh, they hate people. Human beings make them vomit. They're just absolutely disgusted with human beings. They find it abhorrent. They're just yuck. Absolute trash. Total trash. That's what you are. To them, you are trash. Worse than trash. Your feces, your garbage. Demons are just rotten. They're filthy. They're liars. They're sinful. They're evil. They're wicked. Blech. Tonight, I'm going to share with you 
the worst one of all, this one here. The demon of comfort. All right. Now, we've gone over this several times, remember? When you're a child and you're abused, hurt, disappointed, abandoned, and so on as a kid, the devil sends you a special demon, the spirit of rejection. That demon gets into your brain. He starts to morph your personality and train you on how to think and to think like he does. What does he teach you to do? Well, this little short list, again, he teaches you to reject yourself. He teaches you to develop low self-esteem, a low self-concept. He puts thoughts in your mind and tries to train your brain to think in a negative pattern. He teaches you to think negatively. He points out chronic negativity in your environment as a child. He starts out the opposite. He gets into the child's brain and then he starts pointing out nice things. And he, and he puts a thought in your mind. Look at that puppy. Oh, look, there's a flower. Oh, there's a kitty. Look at the kitty. Look at, and he keeps, he keeps doing that. He keeps putting that thought in your mind until something happens. Until the child does something. Do you know what it is? He, as, soon as, as soon as a child does it, their life is never the same again. What is it? What does the child do that changes their life for the rest of their life? He looks. They look. As soon as the thought comes into the child's mind, look at that puppy. Oh, it's so cute. Look, puppy. And as soon as the child looks, they've got him. Now, the child doesn't know the difference between their thought and their own thought. Hello? They keep putting the thoughts in, the kid doesn't get it. Puppy, 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 flower, flower, kitty, 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 kitty. But at a certain time, at a certain age, the child looks. Bang, that's the end. Now the child doesn't know the difference between their thoughts and his thoughts. Now the spirit can control the child, and then they go for the child's emotions and their behavior. It starts in the mind. Am I helping anybody? <clears throat> well, then they start teaching the child to develop low self-esteem, a low self-concept, and a negative thinking pattern. Then. They start getting the child to speak out negativity. That's bad. This is bad. You hurt me. I'm no good. I'm lousy. I'm fat. I'm not like the other kids. I'm stupid. I'm not. And this, the kid starts to word curse themselves. They start to say negative things about themselves. As soon as you speak out something negative, that's, in essence, a prophetic utterance. Okay? What people don't know is... Human beings are all the same. Every human being is the same. You become what you believe. All human beings are the same. They all become in life what they believe. The demons then try to hijack the person's mind to get the person to believe what they believe, which is, you, you, you stink, you're no good, you're, you're, not, you're substandard, you're second rate, you're lousy, you don't get fair treatment, nobody likes you, you're not as smart as the other kids, that you're not athletic, you're not good looking, and it goes on and on. Ten million negative thoughts float through the child's mind through childhood by the time they graduate from high school. And by that time, they're under the demon's control because they don't know the difference between their thoughts and his thoughts because he got in when they were little. Kids don't know the difference. The rejection demon then lets in this monster, the spirit of comfort. He's an insurance policy in the event that you get born again. This spirit hides right in your brain right here. Here's your frontal lobe in your head. And here's what happens in your mind, this part of your brain. 
your mind uses these things in this part of your brain. This is where you use your judgments. This is your processing center. This is your part of your memories there. Your creativity is there. A little bit of your imagination is in your frontal lobe. Your social, social appropriate behaviors are learned in your frontal lobe. Your decision making process goes on in your frontal lobe of your brain. The demon hides in the brain and puts thoughts into your mind. If the person doesn't recognize that process, the demon then can control that person's behavior and turn them into a crazy sinner, so to speak. If you become a born-again Christian in your spirit, man, and you don't know he's in there, what does that demon then do? He ruins your Christian life and makes you ineffective. He turns you into a sinful Christian. He turns you into a backslider. He turns you into an ineffective child of God. Why? Because no one can serve God who doesn't have control of their own mind. No one can serve God who can't control their own mind. Every person is exactly the same. You become in life what you believe. This supernatural activity is known in the sinful world. Okay? They're called motivation speakers. They know what I'm telling you, but they don't understand all of it. Okay? Tony Robbins knows exactly what I'm saying. If you say out loud, I'm poor, I'm broke, I'm an idiot, I'm a fool, I'm a moron, he knows when you said that out loud, that's what you will become. They know that. No one knew this until the last few years, that your thoughts are trackable and monitorable because a thought is a teeny tiny unit of energy. They now have machines they can put on your brain and implants they can put into your mind to read your thoughts. They can now read your thoughts. Paraplegics now can get an implant in their brain, put on a headset, and operate a computer using their mind. Using their mind. This has nothing to do with God. Okay, I'm talking about science. You can put an implant in someone's brain and their mind can operate a computer. Quadriplegic. Is anybody with me? Are you people mad at me? Everybody's staring at me like I'm, I'm stark naked and I'm causing you a deep fear, which is what would happen if I was naked. I'm oh, causing people fear. What happens is the spirit gets into your processing center of your brain here, the frontal lobe. And that's where he runs the show. Yeah. Because the demons and Tony Robbins know that if you say something that you truly believe, that's what you will become. Tony Robbins and demons know if you say to yourself, no one will ever love me, and you say it out loud, and you believe that, that's what will happen. You will have a lifetime of broken relationships. Ruined. If you say uh, out of your mouth what you really believe, you know something? Everybody in my family is, is poor and broke, and that's, that's going to happen to me. The demons and Tony Robbins, no, if you say that and you believe it, that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to live in poverty the rest of your Mickey Mouse life. What you say, if it's what you believe, I'm not talking about saying something silly or a con earth. I'm saying if you say something and you believe it, that's what you will become. They know that. God knows that. Demons know that.
Yeah. This rejection demon ruins your life, but then he lets in this spirit of comfort. This demon is exactly the opposite. He's worse than all the other demons because he doesn't do anything but try to help you. If you're a sinner and you're being tormented mentally or emotionally, this demon shows you how to get some comfort and relief in life. How does he do that? Dr sex, drugs, alcohol, what have you. He brings it to you to help you survive their torment. Spirits create problems and then they create solutions to every problem they create. They make something worse and then they create a pro solution to fix it. They do it every time. If you're a sinner, you're not born again. You're being tormented. They help you. They help you. Alcohol helps you. Drugs help you. It gives you a period of respite. It gives you a, a little relief. It gives you a break. Correct? And they're doing that deliberately to help you to get you to become an addict. If you are a born-again Christian, this demon flips it. He flips. He doesn't try to get you to become a drug addict or an alcoholic. No, it's worse. He starts telling you how wonderful you are. He starts giving you God ideas. Revelations. Oh. God's talking to me. I'm so happy. You say, Brother Mike, you're making this crap up. Am I? Okay, let me prove it to you. Back in the 50s, God called Oral Roberts out of pastoring a tiny little church in Oklahoma. He started fasting and praying and everything. And God gave this guy this freaked out gift of healing. Freaky. This guy must have seen every miracle in the book over the years. He traveled all around the country. He had tents the size of football fields. They were full every night. People were lined up, quadriplegics, every kind of sickness, every kind of disability. Okay? He had this strange anointing in his right hand, he said. He put his, he put his hand on the person's head. He could feel the anointing transferring click to click. Boop, person get healed. This went on for years. Spectacular. Who was watching that? The demon of comfort was watching him. And they started talking to him. And they said, hey, Oral, you're doing a great job. That gift of healing yours is fantastic. Man, you're killing it, boy. But you're getting old. Oral, buddy, you're getting old. You're getting tired. You know what? This healing thing, this is chump change. You need to expand your ministry. You need to open up the city of faith. Oral. Hey, Oral. You need to combine faith healing and medicine. Oral, you're brilliant. Oral, hey. Faith healing, skip it. You need to combine faith healing and academics. <laughs> you still don't believe me, do you? He listened to him. It made sense. He had an avalanche of donors. He did it. He, he built a city in Tulsa. University. He quit. He left his ministry. Went into this one. And the money started running low. Hmm. What are we going to do about that? Well, the demon of comfort came to his rescue again. Hey, how about seed faith? 
You like that? Oral? Hey, oral. Seed faith giving. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that works. See, if you give the God, he'll give to you. Get him oral. It's right in the Bible, oral. It's right there. They'll give you a hundredfold. It's right there in the Bible. See it right there? Demons took the page out and showed it to him. Oh, yeah, it is in there. Yeah, that's what I want to That's a good idea. I'm going to let, I'm going to abandon my ministry. I'm going to open up a university. And I'm going to open up a hospital. Yeah. I'm going to get a bunch of saved doctors. Oh, yeah. A bunch of born again doctors. Yeah, that'll work. That's a ticket. What happened when he retired? Dumped the whole thing in his son's lap. $40 million in debt. Handed the whole ministry over to his son. You know who his son was? <laughs> Don't ask. His son finished running it into the ground. A billionaire, years later, came along and saved the university. Paid the bills and put it up. Never healed anybody again. Gone. You still think you think I'm making this up? I'm not. Hi. Yeah, that's fine. I don't care if you you don't like me. It's fine. Maybe you're not listening. How about another one? Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. Excited for God, bursting with love for God. <laughs> TBN, PTL, booming ministry. And then the demon of comfort came in. What did he do? Did the same thing to them. He did to Oral. Hey, man, you two, you're, you're killing it. You're great. You got a great anointing. You're a wonderful minister. You're doing fantastic. You're anointed. Why don't you go do this and that and that and this? Yeah. And many of you have been called into a ministry by the demon of comfort, and your, your ministry ended up bankrupt and miserable. Remember that? Oh, well, God told me to open this up and go here, and then he told me to open up. Now I'm out on the street. Now I'm over here. I'm under the anointing. How are things going? Terrible. I'm flat broke. Nobody supports me. Everybody let me. Well, really? How'd that work? The demon of comfort comes to you. He makes up stories. He tells you to go into the ministry. He tells you how to get in the ministry. He tells you what to do. Hey, I thought we're going to do. You know what we're going to do for God? Oh, we're going to open up. We're going to open up a hotel. Yeah, there it is. Heritage. Heritage USA. That's what God's called us to do. Oh, this is going to be so great. What we'll do is, the demon of comfort told him, listen, you guys... You guys take in donations for these rooms, and then you, you lease out the rooms every day. You say, hey, you get a free room, at Her and you get to, get to visit the petting zoo. Oh, you get to ride the train. <laughs> and then you get to swim in the anointed pool. Oh, great. Who's telling them this? The demon of comfort. It makes perfect sense. They've got racks of donors. The donors are unlimited, just like Oral Roberts. Guess what happened? Anybody know? The demon of comfort did it again. Pulls a rug out from under you right after you get your ministry built up the way they want you to build it up. What happened to that ministry? Oh, you know, worse. Jail, prison, unbelievable. Oh, here it is. Right down here. Miracle Valley, Arizona. A. A. Allen goes to an Oral Roberts service, 1950s. He's sitting in the service. He goes, my God, all these people are getting healed. I can't believe it. This is what God called me to do. I'm supposed to be doing that. Oral Roberts answers a call. A. A. Allen answers a call. He starts this ministry. Remember? 
Some guy donates him 2,800 acres right down here. It's getting auctioned off by the state of Arizona next month, right down here. 2,800 acres. They, somebody gave him. What they do? They, they, they built Miracle Valley. People getting healed down there, unbelievable. Just, just like Oral Roberts. One after the other. One miracle after the other. Miracles you can't even conceive nor believe. Unbelievable miracles. On and on and on and on. What happened? Well, he, Alan started getting old. He had knee injuries. One of the knee was really bad. He had surgery on it two or three, four times. And he used to be an alcoholic, okay? So and by the time he was eight or nine years old, he was a full blown alcoholic. So what's he doing? So instead, he didn't want to take pain pills, so he started drinking again. He started drinking again. His knee's killing him. He uh, makes an appointment to go see another doctor in San Francisco. He needs another knee surgery. Now, mind you, this is the top faith healer in the United States I'm talking about here. Is anybody getting the context of what I'm saying? Uh, you're all staring at me like I'm from Mars. Is anybody listening to me? I'm getting scared right now. <laughs> He's in San Francisco to go see a doctor's appointment. His knee is killing him. And he, what is he doing? What's he doing? He's drinking. He drinks. He dies in the hotel room. He dies in the hotel room, San Francisco. Didn't make it to the doctor's appointment. The guy who replaces A.A. A. Allen just a side note, came to me years later for counseling and deliverance, okay? Not going to mention his name. This guy takes over the ministry, and like or Robert's son, this guy runs the ministry into the ground. Yeah? The donors start splitting. And there it is today. There's the auditorium where Literally, thousands of people got healed. It's sitting there destroyed. There's the old prayer chapel there. It's empty. The state uh, took it back. Uh, there's $600,000 in taxes owed on it. They're going to try and get some of their money back, and they're going to auction it off next month. But the point I'm trying to make is, and I tried to get you to go to an auction, but to realize that these great men of God got beat by this spirit, because he didn't come after him with evil, wickedness, and filth. He comes after you with Christian ministry ideas. Oh. Is anybody following this at all? I hope you are. This demon is more dangerous than the other ones because he comes to you as a friend. He's trying to help you get your ministry off the ground. Are any of you in a ministry and is it going poorly? Guess who gave you that ministry? The guy I'm revealing to you tonight. Okay? God doesn't call people into the ministry that's jacked up. This thing on? It's not on, huh? All right. God doesn't call people into jacked up ministries. Hello? If God calls you, God will provide. If the spirit of comfort calls you, it will end up in a disaster and he will pull the rug out from under you and leave you with nothing. And if you don't believe me, go down and look at it. It's destroyed. There's a few buildings being used in Heritage USA. Uh, there's a couple of them there, but most of them are empty, vacant, or been vandalized. Not all of them, okay? Oh, are you still going? Some billionaire bailed the whole thing out. Oral and, and uh, uh, his son had nothing to do with it. Sovereign act of God. This, this demon is so powerful and so nasty. He followed Jesus around, treating him exactly the same way. Check it out. Matthew chapter 4. Satan comes to Jesus. Hey, listen. 
You're the son of God, right? Look at it. In Psalms, it says you can just take a dive right off this top of the temple here, the portico. And uh, the angel will take care of you. Go ahead and step out on it. Do that. And then at any time you hit your foot, they'll, they'll bury you up. He's quoting scripture from Psalms, but he's misquoting it. He's misquoting it. What's he, what's he saying there? Well, he's acknowledging, hey, if, look, you're, you're the son of God, and you should be able to just take a dive right here. And, hey, that's a great trip. I mean, people pay a lot of money to go to, to jump out of planes and parachutes and, you know, skydiving. Oh, it's, it's happy. Oh, lots of fun. He wasn't coming at Jesus, attacking him, calling him names, viciously cursing him, was he? No. No, he was trying to get him to acknowledge, hey, you're the son of God, aren't you? Show me. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6 and says, hey, I'm not going to fall for that. Jesus didn't talk, fall for the demon of comfort. Then the demon took him to a giant high mountain and gave him a vision Nobody in the world has ever had since. It's the most spectacular vision anybody's ever seen. He saw all the cities, all the glories of them. I'll give it all to you if you'll fall down and worship me. What was he doing there? Was he coming? Does he come at you with, hey, your trash, your garbage? I hate your guts. I'm going to kill you, threatening you. No. No, no. He, he, he plies you with what, what he thinks you'll bite on. He baits you on stuff he thinks you'll snap at. Is it good stuff? He's happy to use good stuff. That's good stuff, huh? Nobody ever ever offered me all the kingdoms of the world, huh? He's not stupid enough to do that. I'd probably take it and then I'd evict a bunch of people. All this authority, exousia, I will give you. And all the glory of them. Because it's been delivered to me. Now, that's a bad translation there. Paradidomi means to completely surrender something to someone. So it would be like if I was asking you for that notebook. Give me, can you give me the notebook? Give it to me. I want the notebook. Give me the And then he finally just lets me take it. See that? Paradidomi. I just took it. I didn't grab it. He just gave it because I kept trying to receive it. See the difference? It was given to him. Why? Adam gave it to him. He surrendered it. He didn't overtly give it to him. He surrendered it through sin, through stupidity, through ignorance. And I can give it to anybody I want to. He could. He was telling the truth. Jesus didn't correct him with a bunch of lies because he wasn't lying. Mark chapter 1, in the synagogue, there was a demon, a possessed man in there. And it says he, was cry he cried out. Anakrazo means that. Krazo means to yell. Anakrazo means to yell. Well, yell. Really yell. Well, this guy blows up in the service. It's not the guy, it's the demon. The demon is telling Jesus to let us alone, leave us. What do we have to do with you? Are you coming here to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. This demon of comfort is a literal psychiatric genius. He will come to you and tell you how, what a good preacher you are. Oh, man, you're smart. Wow. You know the Bible. Gosh, you can quote the Bible. You've got a great anointing. You ought to be in the ministry. You go in the ministry. You really look good. Look at you, cosmetically, you look great. You look like Brother Mike. And then you've got all the great teaching skills Brother Mike does. You got his fantastic personality. It's fantastic. And you ought to be in the ministry. What, you see, are you seeing what I'm saying? He doesn't come at you that way. He comes at you this way with compliments. He tells you how good you are. He tells you how good you look, how you ought to be in the ministry. And you've got the anointing, so everything's going to go great for you, right? Yeah, why don't you go over to Bangladesh and open up a homeless shelter there? Didn't you hear God talking to you? Go to Bangladesh. 
Oh, I heard from the Lord. No, you heard from somebody, but it wasn't the Lord. And then when you get to Bangladesh, a living hell falls over you. Your ministry falls apart, people abandon you, the money stops coming in, and everything goes bad. Don't, don't tell me you don't know what I'm talking about because you can name people you personally know who've done that. They've gone in the ministry and the whole thing went down the toilet. I got news for you. God doesn't call people in the ministry and then have it go down to the toilet. Whom God calls, he provides. They said, hey, you're the holy one of God. He wasn't insulting him. He was using truth. He was the Holy One of God. Why didn't Jesus listen to him? He said, hold your peace, famao, that means to shut up. Why? <clears throat> because unlike born-again Christians, Jesus never accepted anything from a demon, even if it was true. The devil was speaking truth to Jesus. The devil uses things that are real, things that are right, things that are a fact. It's a fact. See, if in, in Romans, Paul said, you are the slave of the master you serve. So the demons know that if they tell you something good, hey, you're a great preacher. You ought to be in this ministry. Oh, you ought to be doing that. You're supposed to be opening up a center. You're supposed to be... Those are good things, right? Ministry things are good things. Helping people is a good thing, right? That's a good thing. Not if they told you that. Jesus never received anything from the devil, even when he was telling the truth. If you sit around listening to demons tell you good things, you will become his slave. And he owns you. Because you are the slave of the master you serve. What should you do? Exactly what he did. Tomorrow, shut up. Mark chapter 3. Unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him. Cry they were crying. Kradzo, yelling. Not Anna Kradzo. You are the son of God. Is that a lie? No. No. The demons, they love to kill you with compliments. They like to kill you with kindness. Oh, you look good. You're smart. You're attractive. You're brilliant. You're well-educated. Oh, you're rolling. My goodness, you're doing great. It's a trick. Is anybody following this? When he saw Jesus, he cried out, same Greek word, anakrad, so screaming really loud. They would fall down before Jesus, and they would say, Compliments, Son of God, Most High. They called him the Son of God, the Most High. Was that a false statement? No, it was a true statement. The devil will use truth on you to put you in bondage. Baby, you're looking good in those new high heels. Oh, yeah, I like those jeans. It gives you a booty lift. <laughs> See, the devil will compliment your booty until your face falls off if he can get you to listen to him. He'll give you a compliment constantly. He's sucking you in. You're really annoying. You could help these people. Get over there and fix that. Okay. Matthew 22, the Pharisees took counsel how they might entangle him. They sent out the Herodians. Well, who were they? Those were political people from Herod. They said, teacher, 
Didaskalos, they, they called Jesus a teacher. They said, we know that you are true, and they teach the way of God in truth, and you don't care about anybody else, and you don't regard men. You don't regard the person of man. Blah, 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 blah. What was he doing there? Speaking compliments that were true. What were they doing there? What's that called? Flattery. Flattery is not a compliment. A compliment comes to a person without an ulterior motive. Okay, so uh, is that orange? Ink? Coral. I don't believe there is a color named coral. Can somebody take her to the prayer room? She's making up colors. Okay. If I tell her that I like coral and it's a compliment, there's no ulterior motive on my end. I was just paying someone a compliment. That's kind of a nice thing to do. If I flatter someone, there's a hidden agenda behind a compliment when it becomes flattery if I want something from her, see? And secretly, I've always wanted to sell coral shirts. <laughs> so I'm complimenting her, hoping she'll sell me that one. That's flattery. Flattery. My coral addiction popped up. What are they doing here? My grandpa used to say, they're buttering you up. Okay, that's an old term you probably never heard. Back in the 50s, it was just somebody's buttering them up. Okay. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to give Kansas? Shall we take this poll tax from the Romans? See, Herod and the Herodians were politicians. Here's how it worked. Herod went to Caesar, and Caesar says, you can, you can be the king of Judah. You, you can have the kingship, but you get them to mind. He says, no problem. So Herod forced the Jews to obey the Romans so he could stay in power. We call them politicians today. Rotten people who are pathological liars get voted fake votes and then they get into office and they lie and steal some more. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, the Herodians, that's what they were. They were politicians. They hated Jesus because people considered him an authority. And like our society now, if you consider something God an authority, the government's going to come after you because they're your new authority now. They don't like you having other authorities. Is anybody listening? Kansas was a poll, poll tax on Jews. And they're trying to get Jesus into a political mix here. But you notice how they did it? They complimented him first. And they spoke truths to him. First, the devil gets in using truths, positive statements, affirming. He loves to be an affirmer. He's on social media. He's an influencer. Matthew 22, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now what are they doing there? They're asking him an honest, sincere question, but an honest, sincere question that has a motivation behind it is not an honest, and sincere question. It's a form of manipulation. So they asked him an honest question. Why? Because nobody really knew. Which is the greatest commandments? Why is that? Well, it's called uh, the Decalogue. There were 613 laws the Jews lived by, okay? 248 of them, scribes, one for each scribe in the Sanhedrin. And then they had one law for every day of the year. So this guy asked Jesus a legitimate question. Which of these 613 laws which are the greatest commandments? But it, he had an ulterior motive. The devil will ask you questions that appear to be fair, decent, and honest to lead you into destruction. When I was a uh, secular counselor, I had a 
part of my practice was litigation. And I was hired by lawyers all over the state as an expert witness to testify in court. I was one of the top witnesses in the state. I didn't really like doing litigation work, but I liked it because it paid more. Master's degree. <laughs> you don't have one, I do. I could make double billing on a legal case. Raking in the dough. <laughs> dough is an old term my grandma, grandpa taught me. It means money, money. None of you have ever heard of that, but dough means money. I got deposed hundreds of times by lawyers. You sit there with a court reporter, right? Well, what's a court reporter? It, they're a highly skilled typist, top of the line. They take down everything you say. If you grunt, <clears throat> they put pass gas, boop, pop it on there. The lawyers ask you questions. They say, is this true? Well, yeah. It's an obvious question. Is the sky blue sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, yeah. Then they would say, is, is it sometimes turn cloudy? Yeah. See, the lawyer will lead you up to the kill. They'll get you to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then wouldn't this also be that? Hello? And I knew what they were doing. After a few years, you caught on to the system. But the point I'm trying to make is the devil does it all the time. He'll ask you a legitimate question. Well, is the rapture before the tribulation? Okay, on the, on the surface of it, that's not a vicious, hateful, evil, wicked question, is it? No, but it is. It's designed to get you into an argument about the Bible. So the question is actually wicked, even though the question itself is not wicked. And you shouldn't have anybody ask you that anyway. I've already explained it. But anyway, there were 613 laws. And the guy's asking him a legit question. But it was a trick. It's a trick. Acts chapter 24. Paul's in trouble. Remember that? He's arrested. They want to kill him. They tried to stone him. They take him to Ananias. Here it is, Acts 24. And they take him to the governor. Remember that? Remember the story? Uh, you've all read it, haven't you? Elizabeth. I'm about ready to go. Okay, would you please read this story this week? Thank you. Paul's in trouble. He's on trial, okay? And so what happens? I just got through telling you about my, my experiences with lawyers. Okay, here we are again. Now we're in, we're in a court of law, so to speak. They take him to the governor. Tertullus is there. And Tertullus is an orator, a great speaker. And uh, he's a Roman. And he's going to accuse Paul. The Jews want him. The Jews hired him. We got to get this guy dead. They tried to stone him. You read the story. He was miraculously saved. Amen. Seeing that uh, Tertullus then starts to butter up. Uh, another term is blow smoke up his fanny. That's another phrase. Uh, he starts telling Phoenix what a wonderful governor he is, how great he is, and all these wonderful things he's done for the Jews. Why is he telling him that? Because he wants, they want Paul dead. It's a trick. The devil will compliment you till the cows come home if you will listen to him so he can lead you to another area and destroy you. He will use compliments to finish you. And we always accept what you do, Felix, and blah, blah, blah. You've sent us a great job. We're so grateful for everything you've done. Felix, can you bend over and pull your robe up? And What's he doing there? He's buttering the guy up, but he's doing it maliciously. He wants Paul dead. <clears throat> That's what the devil does. He gives you compliments 
so he can kill you. I threw this in just as an aside, you know, uh, some of our YouTube people are Bible scholars. I you know, throw stuff in. This is, this is what Felix was. That's how he got his job. He did a lot of great things for the Jews. That's what, the, that's what Tertullus was talking about. You know, Josephus talks about it. Why does, the, why does this demon, why is he so dangerous? Why does he use flattery? Because it's so effective. Flattery, flattery gives the the listener, a false sense of security. You don't know you're getting played. See? I did it every Friday night, practically, when I was living in sin. I used to go to happy hour at Aunt Chalada's up on North uh, 7th, uh, 7th, 16th, North 16th, worth. <laughs> Okay, I can't remember where it is anymore. But anyway, I was there every Friday night. And, uh, you know, this is what it is. Flattery, you know, it's, it's a pickup line. What's a pickup line? It's, it's a form of flattery. Baby, you're looking good. Boy, you, you're doing great, you know. Uh, how's the weather at your house? You know, I had a lot of great pickup lines that were like top of the line. Never failed, obviously. Uh, of course. Uh, Flattery is evil because you're, you have an ulterior motive to damage that person. So you don't care about that chick. All you want to do is take her home. Hello? So that naturally, their outfit looks great. Oh, their makeup's perfect. Oh, it's all great. It's all perfect. Flattery destroys people. The devil uses it all the time. It's one of his greatest weapons. He wiped out Oral Roberts' ministry. He wiped out Tammy Faye Baker's ministry. He, Miracle Valley is down here in, in shreds, right down there. How's he do it? He builds you up, pumps you up with flattery, which is actually lies. First Corinthians chapter 8, now touching things offered to idols, we see, Edu, we see that we all have gnosis understanding. What is an, what is an agnostic? What, we get our English word agnostic from this Greek word gnosis, which means understanding. So if somebody explains to me two plus two is four, four I have understanding that that math problem ends up that way. Two plus two is four. Masters. Then he says, but understanding stuff can puff you up. Fusiao is the Greek word. It means to inflate your ego. See? But agape, unconditional love, oiko de mayo, builds you up, builds up the person. Okay. Flattering someone is exaggerating their positives, giving them a false sense of security and false sense of capacity, false sense of ability. Okay. It's all fake. The devil has to flatter you to get you to go into this ministry so you can screw that ministry up. You're not just going to go over to this ministry and screw up. It's not going to happen. You've got to be pumped up to make your move. Because you have to think, hey, well, I, I can do it. Yeah, I'm on this thing. Yeah, I've got the favor of God all over me. That's right. <laughs> powerful. I'm powerful. You can't just wake up morning. You know, I think I'll start this ministry. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go downtown and get a bullhorn and start a service outside the hospital here. I notice there's a lot of homeless people here. I think I'm going to go down there and do that. Hey, Jesus loves you. 
God cares about you. Well, that sermon is all positive and true, isn't it? Why is that ministry going to fall apart if it's a positive and true? Jesus never listened to anything demons said, even when they said truth. Flattery will get you to get involved in things you should never be involved in. Like Oral Roberts, 40 million dollars in debt. Was he a bad man, a rotten person? Of course he wasn't. He's was a wonderful man. What had happened? He was listening to them. Puff him up. Hey, this healing thing's not working. We need to expand. Fusiao, what happens when you puff somebody up? You give them a false sense of security. What happens to a helium balloon? It's, it goes up and up and up. Why? Helium is lighter than air, right? So if helium is in a balloon, the balloon's going to continue to go up, all the way up, until what? Until there's no air. As the helium seeps out of the balloon, where does the balloon go? Where does the people go? Crash. God called me to do this. I heard it. I got, I got a word from a prophet. A prophet came from my church and spoke to me. A prophet came to your church and spoke to you. Yes. If you've been spoken to by a prophet tonight, God has given me the slapping anointing. You come down here, and I'm going to slap that prophet right out of your head. <laughs> prophet gave me the word. No, I can't get myself started. There is no faithfulness in their mouth. Why? They're flatterers. They're using positive things. They're telling you facts. They're giving you truth. To trick you and trap you. That's what Satan does. That's what this demon does. He's comforting you. He's giving you assurance. See, the rejection demon spent your whole life running you into the ground. This one comes by and says, hey, I'm going to build you up. You do man. Why? Because he can't let you live a productive Christian life. He's got to get you to backslide. He's got to turn you into a sinful Christian. He has to do it. You think you're going to sit there and watch you serve God and start bearing truckloads of fruit? Are you crazy? That's not going to happen. They're going to try to stop it. Paul said to Timothy, I want you to war a good warfare. This is not a cakewalk. It's a war. And he fights dirty. He, he uses positive things. You're smart. You're sweet. You're brilliant. You know the Bible. Oh, you're a lovely person. Really. You're exactly what he's looking for if you're listening to him. You know a red flag? You're in big trouble. Anybody know? If somebody starts paying you a lot of compliments. You're in, you expect the hammer to fall in about a day or two. Uh huh. Uh huh. Acts 16. Paul's on a missionary journey as usual. God love him. And some demons following him all around. You've read the story, right? Starting to get a stomach ache. You're going to read the story this week, aren't you? <laughs> in this great story, this is spectacular. Acts 16 is my favorite chapter of the New Testament. I love Acts 16. It's wonderful. Is this working? Right. This demon's following him around. 
in a Podesky, a female slave. So these two guys, or three guys, whatever they were, they're using this girl. Because she has supernatural powers given to her by this spirit, she's a fortune teller, so people would come to her like they have now. Not a psychic hotline, they're, they're all frauds. But I mean, a real, a real uh, person that has power can read your thing and do cards. There's, there's some legitimate power to it. Not, not, the guys, not the gals on the phone. But this is a different situation. This gal had real power. And they made a lot of money off of her. She would tell fortunes. And uh, she had a Puthan demon, a, a snake, a python spirit. And these are divinators. They tell the future, the fortune tellers. Thus saith the Lord. You ever been in a church where the prophet tells you, the Lord told me this and that? Okay. Stop. Stop doing that. Hmm. Puthone spirits. They tell you the future. Okay? And this demon says, uh oh, the real deal's here. The, the jig's up. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach myself to Paul. So if I can get attached to Paul, I will be accepted and I'm not going to get exposed. How does this demon do it? Well, he keeps following her around. Her lords made a lot of money from Susain, Mantuomai. She was a fortune teller. And it says they followed Paul around yelling, Kradzo. She was yelling it out. Hey! What was she doing? Lying? Hurling vulgar profanity? No! This spirit of comfort will not attack you with nasty stuff. He, he brings the good stuff in. You're great. You're anointed. You're powerful. Oh, you're smart. Everybody respects you. Oh, jeez, you look sharp. And she said, they are slaves of the hoop sisters, most high God. She was a slave, Pedeski, see? So she's saying, I'm a slave, and they're slaves. So we're the same. See that? Pedeski is a female slave. She calls Paul a slave, doulos. And then she compliments Paul. She's trying to attach herself to him to bring herself up to his level. He is a slave. I'm a slave. He's a slave of the most high God, not the regular gods that we got all around town here. This is the most high God, the highest God. See that? And they're showing us how to get saved. And she, he was telling the truth. The demon was telling the truth. He tells the truth. He, he gives you facts. He butters you up. He gives you compliments to lure you in. There's an ulterior motive. He, he wanted to attach himself to Paul so he had some credibility. For example, let's just use Hinduism for, for a second here. The, de the demon was saying, here's the number one he Hindu god, Ganesha. Is that how you pronounce it? Huh? Ganesha. Is that how you pronounce it? That's supposed to not. Again, hey, I'm not an expert here. I'm just using an illustration. Don't send me an email. I think, I think this is, is it? I think this is the number one god. This is Lord Shiva. I, I think that's the number two god. I'm not sure. Don't hold me to that. But anyway, she wasn't saying Paul represented those two gods. She said he represented the God above them. Okay? The highest of all gods. That's who Paul represented. And so the demon was trying to attach himself to the most high God. Jesus would never allow that. And Paul, being grieved, dia ponemai, means he got concerned because this is going on every day. This demon is chronically attacking him. The devil will constantly come after you over and over again, paying you one compliment after the other until you start listening to him. He's trying to get you to listen to him. He's drawing you in. He's killing you with kindness. He's telling you how good you are. He compliments the things you've legitimately done. Hey, you're doing a good job praying. Hey, you did a good job at the altar last night praying for those people. Hey, you did a great job with the food service. 
Those people were hungry. Well done. I know this sounds nuts, but these spirits will compliment you as you serve God. Why? They can't stop you from doing it, so they're going to bootleg onto it and lead you into some silly corner you can't get out of later. Paul was having none of it. Hey, you got to go. One day, King Herod, okay, remember, he had killed James, right? He'd, he'd thrown Peter in prison, okay, so this guy was a sworn enemy of the Lord Jesus, right? Okay, Herod gets all decked out. What are the demons doing? They're telling Herod, hey, you the man, you're, you're the king, you look at this outfit, you look great in that outfit. Spirits tell me that all the time. They say, well, this, Mike, you're looking great. I go, oh, shucks. You know, I do it. He gets out there. Why don't you give him a speech, man? You're so smart. You sound so good. Man, you ought to be on TV. You ought to be a TV preacher, Herod. That's what you need to be. Yeah. Oh, boy. And the people go, oh, my God, that's amazing. So the demons in the people listening to him, the demons in the crowd, start cheering and complimenting Herod. You see that? You know, the whole thing was a setup. Set up based on what? Positivities. Positive. You see, positivity is just as bad as vulgarity. It's all designed to destroy you. The end. You can go, go to hell having somebody cursing you all the way, can't you? You can go to hell having somebody paying you compliments all the way. What's the bottom line for them? Where you end up. That's all they care about. How you get there. They're open to it. So they told Herod, hey, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And Herod goes, boy, I really am. That's great. Boom. He gets stricken with an illness. Scolicarpitus is a means maggots. What's going on here? I don't really know. I don't know what happened here. He got some kind of an illness in his body, and it sounds like some kind of a what would you call that? Uh, parasites or something? Anyway, that made him so sick that he exuco. His soul completely left his body, is what that Greek word means. His soul came out. Well, the only thing I could find on it was in the writings of Josephus right here, book 19. He said that Herod fell into deep sorrow and had severe stomach problems and died after five days. That's what Josephus said about this incident. The only thing we know about this incident is this part that I just read to you in the text. So if you add those up, it looks like he had some kind of a weird parasite. But anyway, the point of the whole story was if, if he got sucked in with compliments, building him up, puffed up, you get puffed up and you think you're something you're not, and then you're dead. <clears throat> if a man thinks himself to be something he, when he's nothing, he deceives himself. That's the purpose of Satan in the book of Revelation. It says he is the deceiver of the whole world, including the Christian world. Chronicles. Uzziah. What happened to him? You remember the story. First Chronicles chapter 26. If you haven't, you ought to read it. It's really fascinating. To to say Uzziah was on a winning streak is putting it mildly. This guy was skyrocketing to victory. Everything the guy touched turned to gold. He was winning, 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 winning. King of Israel, right? Uh oh. What I'm about to say, uh, it's not going to go over that well. You know, 
If you pray a lot and you get a lot of prayers answered, the demons can't stop that. But you know what they can, they can do? You know what they do? I prayed about this and that and this and that, and it happened. God answered my prayers. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> the demons will follow that right up. Man, you're a prayer warrior. You ought to be an intercessor. You ought to be praying here and there and everywhere. You are really something special. Ah, look at that. Why don't you pray about that twitch you've developed? Well, I'm too busy for that. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you start thinking, man, I am. I can pray better than these other crits. Jeez. I've been, I've been doing deliverance. I must be an expert on deliverance. I had one person delivered this year. Wow, I mean, I ought to have a certificate of some kind. You don't see that? If, if you start getting answers to your prayer, the demons will go along with it, hoping to get you puffed up. You become like Uzziah. Everything going your way. God's giving you everything. This guy's on a roll. It won't stop. Remember that? And the guy goes, you know something? I am so hot right now. Me and Jehovah, we're tight. I am going to do something I always wanted to do. I'm going into the temple. I'm walking right in there. I'm the king. I'm in charge. I'm the boss. Who told you that? The demon of comfort keeps telling him, hey, you're the king. You're the boss. You're in charge. He will always tell you how great you are, how wonderful you are. Oh, what a good job you're doing. Oh, you're getting your prayers answered. My gosh, you're anointed. He says, I'm going to go in and offer incense. Yeah. What happened? That's a riot. The priest went in after him. Eighty priests, 81 people panicked. 81 people panicked to run him down. He wouldn't stop. See, when the devil gets you absorbed with compliments and positivity, you'll get to the point where you won't listen to anybody. And you'll just run in somewhere where angels fear to tread. You'll just go right on in. Yeah. That's what he did. Everything was going so well. He had so many prayers answered. He was so good at winning. Nonstop. Everything he touched. Every war he fought, everything, Uzziah, on top of everything. And the demons told him he could do it. The spirit of comfort came to him. Hey, you're the man. You're the king. You're the boss. Go on in and offer some incense to Jehovah. You and Jehovah are like that, aren't you? You guys are right there, right? Yeah, that's right. And hey, who's talking to me right now? It must be God. 81 priests panic, chasing him in there to stop him. And they couldn't. What happened? Flip down this later in the chapter. Turned into a what? Leper. Had to live in a special house. His son took over his ministry. Whoa. How did it all happen? How did it all happen? Did the demons threaten him, yell at him, belittle him? What are you, aren't you the king? You gutless, you worthless punk. Go on in and offer the incense. No! No, it was, it was compliments. It was adulation. It was praise. Got him. Daniel chapter 4, what a great chapter that is. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, well, anyway, he was the king of Israel. And uh, some of you named your kid that, right? It used to be a popular name for kids when I was young. I'm making that up. I never heard anybody. But anyway, that's a stupid name. But how that guy got that name, I don't know. I'm not interested. But this guy pulled a Uzziah. Everything 
is going his way. He, he's winning from A to Z. He's unstoppable. Yeah. Well, he's taking a nap one night. Remember that? He has a dream. He has a dream. He wakes up and he calls in all of his witch doctors and sorcerers, witches, warlocks. Everybody comes in, banging chains, walking in with tattoos, belching and burping, passing gas. We can't figure it out. Can't figure it out. I'll tell you what, go, go get Daniel the prophet. He's got the spirit of the Most High God. Ah, oh, there's Most High again. That's snuck in there. He can figure it out. So Daniel comes to the king and he says, hey, yeah, he tells him the whole long dream. Oh, man, detail after detail. It's a long one. Daniel prays about it and tells him what the dream means. And it's a warning dream. It was a warning dream. And, yeah, that's how you could tell it was from God. Right? Because the demons wouldn't do that, would they? What would they do? The demon of comfort would have just kept pumping that guy up. He would have just kept pumping him up until his entire kingdom was destroyed. So God stepped in and gave him a warning. This dream is telling you, hey, you got to snap out of it. And then Daniel says to him, let my counsel be acceptable. Break off your sins. Come on, change. Stop yelling at your wife and kids. Stop losing your temper. Stop taking offenses. Stop bossing people around. Stop oppressing the poor. Make changes. Repent. Stop talking the way you're talking. Stop doing what you're doing. Translation. I'm translating it. And if you do that, your kingdom will lengthen and things will go well for you, right? If you quit, if you quit sinning tonight and you repented of your sin, guess what? The Bible says be sure your sin will find you out. When it comes there, there's nothing to find out because you repented of it. Hello? If you don't repent of it, be sure your sin will find you out. You're going to fail again, you're going to lose again, and you're going to take a dump again. That's what's going to happen. You're going to get reinfected with demons, and you're going to call down somebody, probably me. Hey, Brother Mike, I want to talk to you for a minute. I'm having some problems. I wonder what happened. Change, and this will go better for you, Daniel says. Right? He didn't listen. Chapter 4. He goes up on top of the walls, right? Every great, great city back then had giant walls. You could ride chariots on the top of them. They were that big, right? He's walking up there, taking a walk. And then the demons put this thought in his mind. A negative thought? Go kill yourself. Go kill the people. Shoot the poor. Burn this. No. Uh-uh. No. No, no, no. No, no, no. They start complimenting on all of his accomplishments. See, nobody had more spiritual accomplishments than Paul, right? He, he would come into town. Untold people would get saved. He would walk by a bunch of people, and a shadow fell on them, and they all got off their stretchers and started jumping around. Unbelievable. Hundreds of healings, thousands of people saved, thousands of all year, and year after year, month after month. He says, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind me, and I reach for those things that are before me. I reach for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, how could you forget all those wonderful things that happened in your past? What was he doing there? The demons were telling me, hey, you're the, you're the greatest apostle that ever lived. You're wonderful. My God, your gift of healing is off the chart. You've got all nine gifts of the Spirit coming out of your ears. You the man, and then some. No, Paul wouldn't have it. No. He said, I'm forgetting that. I'm keeping here. In Hebrews, Paul told the Jews, Jesus is the author and the finisher of my faith.
You know what he also forgot? Whippings, beatings. The Jews beat him half to death. They beat him with rods. They beat him with whips. Stranded in the sea. Chased. Stoned. Everything. He forgot that too. What are you supposed to do? Exactly what he did. No, nope, Nebi couldn't do it. He doesn't listen to Daniel. He goes out and the demons tell him, hey, look at what you have done. Take a look at this. And it was utterly amazing. Here's the ruins of some of it, but Saddam Hussein rebuilt part of it. And he had, a, I think he used it at a vacation home or something, but the allied forces were using the palace during the Iraq war. Remember that? But anyway, here's a drawing as best they can figure it out of ancient Babylon. And here were the botanical gardens, the, what was it, the sixth wonder of the world or something, whatever they called it. The, the place was unbelievably beautiful. It was one of the greatest places on the face of the earth by far. And he had, he had done a spectacular job, and it went to his head, to quote my granddad. What happened to the guy? Well, he came down with a serious mental illness called lycanthropy. And it's a mental illness where a human being thinks they're an animal. Lycanthropy. He became totally disabled and lost his kingdom. He didn't listen to the dream. He didn't listen to Daniel. But he did listen to compliments and positive statements, statements given to him by Satan. The devil kept pumping him up, and he believed him, to use a slang, he believed his own press. King Herod died because he believed his own press. But it's not really his own press, it's Satan's press. He compliments you to capture you. Lucos Anthropos. Lycanthropy is a Combination of two words. Here it is, the Greek word. First one, Lucas. Wolf. Anthropus. Man. See that poster? I saw that movie when I was a kid. That's right. Yeah, this came out back in the early 60s. I saw it. It scared me half to death. Look at this. Claude Rains was in it. LeBron, Lon Chaney's in it. Can you believe that? Ralph Bellamy's in it. Thank you, Brother Mike, for listing names no one's ever heard of or cares about. What a, what a great teaching. What a mesmerizing teaching. I can't wait to pay you some compliments. So that you are, 1 Corinthians 5, you are puffed up and have not mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away. Ex iro means completely removed from your group. What happened was uh, a, a, a guy died. His dad kicked a bucket, and one of his wives, not his birth mother, but his stepmom, uh, she was bootalicious. So he says, hey, my dad's not around anymore, and uh, he's not going to complain about it, so I'm going to tap into her. Paul heard about it and freaked. He freaked out. That's fornication, he said. You can't, you can't, you can't marry or sleep with someone that was married or sleeping with your dad. What are you doing? Okay, he goes nuts, berserky. Hey, get rid of the guy. Get him out of there. Okay. We following this? Yeah. <clears throat> Here's the reason you can't get healed or delivered. Okay. Listen to me carefully. People don't. In our society, people don't care. And when you sin and you hurt someone or you hurt yourself, the person you hurt the most was your Heavenly Father. And if you don't have any heartbroken pain over what you did to your Heavenly Father, what pain are you going to have over what you did to this person or what you did to yourself. Okay? The Holy Spirit 
rushes over to people who have godly sorrow, who recognize through the conviction of their conscience that I did something wrong, and what I did wrong hurt my Heavenly Father's feelings. He has feelings, and one of them is love for me. And my Heavenly Father loves me more than my parents or my spouse or my kid ever did or ever could. He's the only person that's ever truly loved me. And when I hurt myself or hurt somebody else, I'm actually hurting him. Well, in this ministry, people that don't have any godly sorrow and don't have any mourning over their sin are very hard to get delivered from demons. And half of them, we can't get delivered from demons. They don't have any, they just don't care. And that's what our whole society is like now. Nobody gives a rat's fanny. It's just do it and live with it. And when you treat God like that, your chances of getting delivered or healed are zero. So Paul said, listen, if you guys don't have any conviction over this and you're not, get that guy out of there. That's going to spread. Why did he do that? <clears throat> because look at Hillsong. Look at Acts 29. Look at all these mega churches. As soon as somebody starts committing adultery, as soon as, soon as affairs break out, as soon as the pastor starts sleeping with the secretary, the, demons, the lust demons start hopping from person to person. It spreads. Adult, adultery spirits spread in a congregation. And Paul wanted him out of there. Because lust demons transfer to other people. And you're going to have all kinds of people having sex in your church. They either repent or you get them out. <laughs> Proverbs 7. This applies to both men and women. Here it describes what I was talking about earlier when I was living in sin, going to happy hour. The devil uses compliments and positive statements to try to get you trapped and destroy your life. Ain't this made any sense? James said, uh, the devils also believe and they tremble. Remember that statement? And uh huh. Remember that? Uh, when I read that years ago, I didn't understand that. It make any sense to me? It does now. You know, it's weird. We have this person comes here for deliverance, and boom, the demons are flying them out of them like bottle rockets. This person comes for deliverance, and two hours later. We're trying to get them to get one demon out. You ever notice that? Well, I'll tell you, we have. And God showed me. Demons get scared when people are truly sorry they hurt God's feelings. They get scared. And when somebody gets scared, they start trembling. Okay, you know, you ever see anybody have a panic attack? I've had them have them right in my office. Uh, obviously, it was their fault. They would have anything to do with me, but uh, they start shaking. They start doing their start clammy, hands get sweaty. They start to kind of start hyperventilating. When they start having a panic attack, a fear demon starts manifesting and gives them a panic attack. They start feeling frightened. They have anxiety for no reason. Their hands are sweating. They start to shake. You know, these people that get delivered real easy start shaking and manifesting. You know why they're doing that? Hey, 
you know, they, they're sorry for their sin. They, they hurt God's feelings and they want to be forgiven. They, they want to change. They want to stop hurting the Lord. And the demons recognize that immediately. They can sense that just like that. And they start shaking. They start having a panic attack. Start manifesting. And as soon as we see that happen, then we jump right in and boom, they come out. Right, Jim? They just come right out. The other one? The other person? In this ministry, you know what we'd rather have here? A big rack of sinners. I'd love to bust a bunch of stinking sinners in here. You know what? They're much easier to work with. They're easy to get healed. They're easy to get delivered. A bunch of sinners come in. You preach in hardcore Christianity. You blast them with the gospel. This bunch of sinners will run out the door and say, F you, Brother Mike. I'm good with that. Bless you. But these people will repent. And they'll get healed and saved right on the spot. Rock hard, stinking sinners right there. You know what beats us into the ground? Yeah. Christians. 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 Not sinners. I have never. Never left the house of healing. I never left the deliverance center. Ever. One night. I went home. Drove by the drive through liquor and got me a bottle of gin. Never. Never. I never did that one. Bunch of sinners. Have I thought about that with a bunch of Christians? I have. Work all day with the, trying to get Christians delivered? I've driven home and saw the lights at the drive through liquor, and I had something trying to, something was, I fought, and I got that, I pulled it back. Why? How can that be? Listen to me carefully. <clears throat> Sin is relative. I'm going to close with this, okay? I apologize for dragging out, dragging this out. Sin is relative. Okay, that's, that's blasphemy. No, it isn't. <clears throat> what's a sin to you may not be a sin to her okay if God tells you to do something he didn't tell her to do it so if you don't do it it's a sin to you if you don't do it it's not a sin because God didn't ask you to do it but he asked Gary to do it does that make sense sin is relative there are absolute sins for example, thou shalt not, boom, boom, boom. Okay, that's a, that's a universal sin. Correct? Huh? Thou shalt not have sex with children. Okay, that's a universal sin. Correct? But if, if God told Gary to go do this and that, and he didn't do it, that's a sin. But, if, but it's not a sin for you if you don't go do this and that. Correct? Sinning, sin, the Greek word is hamartia, it means to miss the mark. It was an archery term. You know, so if you went like this, and you missed the bullseye, that was hamartia, that was you missed the mark. Your sin missed the mark of holiness, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody, phew, ah, misses a target. Only Christ, the Holy Son of God, hit the target perfectly. Right? That's sin. Missing the mark. Missing the target. Sin is worse when a Christian does it than when a sinner does it. And the reason for that is, Jesus said, to him who is given much, much is required. When a Christian sins willfully and deliberately, 
they are giving legal rights and access to Satan at a greater level than a sinner was. When I was living in sin, I, was, I had a girlfriend. I chronically committed adultery. I was just doing what sinners do. I was just enjoying my sex life with my girlfriend. Okay? Because I was sinning. Sinners sin. But if I did that now, that sin would be worse for me than it was then. Because then I was living in sin, ignorantly, stupid, not knowing what I know now in God's Word. Correct? So there's more accountability in me now as a Christian than there was when I was a sinner, if that makes any sense. <clears throat> so in this ministry, if we can't get the Christians to repent of their sins, you know, it's like pulling teeth out of yaks to get demons out of these people. But the ones who are broken, who have sorrowful and mourned for hurting their Heavenly Father, those spirits start panicking because they know they have to come out. That's why they shake. That's why they panic. They're beat. Well, it's up to God. No, it isn't. The Holy Ghost is the same whether you repent or not. The only thing that's different is the godly sorrow in that Christian. Why don't they just change? Hey, you, that's a good question. Would you like to answer it? I would. The more you do something, the less wrong it is. Okay, I'll tell you one last story then. I don't normally lie during my teachings, but I'm, I am tonight. I'm not going to obviously name any names, but when I was at the Assemblies of God uh, church years ago, uh, I did mentoring over there. And this was before I went through deliverance. I didn't know what demons were. I was just mentoring people at the church. You know, I was a count, professional counselor, secular counselor, so I was working at church now, and now I'm mentoring people. And one of the guys I, that I was mentoring had this terrible lust spirit, and he had uh, sexual desire for kids, girls, young girls, minors. And yeah, I spent, I don't know how long counseling the guy, and this was, phew, when was this, 25 years ago? 20, I, I don't remember exactly, but it was, it was a long time ago. Anyway, uh, fast forwarding, I got delivered from demons in 2004. I didn't see the guy for years. Then I saw the guy, and then uh, I went over to his house to pray for him, and some demons came out, and he, he wasn't what I went through. He didn't have the godly sorrow. He didn't have the mourning over what he had done, and so I, a few demons came out, but nothing. And then later on, he uh, fondled a girl. Uh, he got pros prosecuted. He, he went to prison. He got out on early release. Then he went into a, a rehabilitation program with the state of Arizona, and he was in that program for years and years and years. Normally, they're in the program about 12 to 14 months. The, the sex offenders, they come out, and they transition into a group home, go through the program, they go get a job, they move out in society, okay? Then they have a probation officer, sometimes they wear an ankle. And this guy transitions out, he's in the rehabilitation program, where they try to reconstruct your mind to get it off of kids. And in the secular world, they teach you to be a chronic masturbator so that when you have sexual desires, go ahead and masturbate and relieve it. Okay, they teach you how to watch your eyes. They, they have you read books. They teach you about minors. They go through this whole training program of how to get these sex offenders to stop offending. It's the secular world. Okay, this is, this is how they do it. And 
I, a few years later, he calls me. You know, he wants me to go to his wedding. You know, I go, go to your wedding. Who are you marrying? Uh, well, this girl, and uh, she's real nice, and uh, she's got two daughters. She's got two daughters. How old are they? Well, one of them's this age. Oh, one of them's that age. Oh. I go, oh, I'm feeling bad. I'm not feeling well. I have him come in and see me. This time I was very aggressive with him. Well, God mercy showed up. This guy hits the floor in my office. Boom! Spirits are flying out of this poor guy. He goes back home. Uh, six, eight months later. Whoop. Hey, Brother Mike, I need you to come in again. Oh, no. Now I'm shaking. You need to come in again. Yeah. Well, he had puttered around with her daughter. Now, I, it was like Job. You know, the thing that I feared the most came upon me. It, it came upon me. N I said, come on in immediately. I clear my schedule. I, he comes in again. God's mercy all over us. He hits the floor again. Repenting, crying, oh, everything, all of it. He goes home. The daughter made a comment to his new wife about him coming in to her room. She goes, coming into the room for what? Okay, now, now it's like you, you know, a polar bear comes out of the cave there. You know how the mother is. Yeah, not happy. And I'm not going to give you any of the details, but a miracle happens. And this guy doesn't go back to prison. Yeah. I said, listen, you're going to have to come in here. You know, I, I need to see you. Let's set up a system, you know. I don't, don't, don't come in like once every other year. We, we can't do that anymore. Never heard from him again. I still haven't heard from him. It's been about three years. If you commit a sin and you keep doing it, it will become nothing to you. And then we can't get you healed. We can't get healed. Let's pray then.